teaching from scripture, especially when I do it. Um, 99% of the things I'll say today are for me. <laughs> okay? If you get something out of it, I'm super excited for that. But a, a lot of times it's, it's, I mean, this is God dealing with me. And um, you, when you preach or, or when you're pastoring, what I've learned over the years is that I just get to experience everything that I'm going to tell you the week before I tell you. <laughs> and then you guys get to go on and experience this week. So what we'll talk about today will may come up this week in your life. I mean, this is the way God works. Uh, his word is, is living and, and, you know, moving and, and um, transforms us all the time. And so uh, I'll tell you that I've been in front of thousands of people preaching and singing. Crowds don't bother me. But any time I get ready to do this, I'm sick every time. <laughs> And it's not that I'm afraid to be up in front of somebody. It's, it's the weightiness of what I'm going to do. When the Bible talks about don't take the name of the Lord in vain, uh, a lot of times we would like to kind of equate that to swearing. And really what that verse is talking about, that commandment is misrepresentation of him in every part of our life. I mean, we break that commandment way more than we think we do. And so that, that weighs on me, too. It's like, okay, I'm going to open up the Bible, and I'm going to teach, and I'm going to do the best I can. You know, I've studied and prepared and everything else, and I trust God would do the same. I mean, if you go look through Scripture, um, God uses some of the weirdest people and situations to get his message across. I mean, look at Balaam and his donkey. <laughs> Right? It's like, Balaam's not listening. And he's like, all right, well, here goes the donkey. And I figure if God can use a donkey, I'm safe. Right? So, you know, this is, I'm trusting that as his word goes out, the Holy Spirit will speak to you somehow in the way you need it. And, and, and over the years, I've heard, it's like you were following me around all week. I Trust me, I wasn't. I was at work. You know, I, it's. It's just the way God works, and he works in his word, he works through his word, and he works through his people. And I'm going to cover a very, very, very familiar psalm today. It's probably the best, I would probably, probably say the, the most well-known psalm, Psalm 23, right? Now, not a very long one, but there's a lot in there. But... I want to kind of focus on some aspects of it that deal with us. And, and I'm, again, saying, I'm talking to me. Okay? I'm not a really good sheep. Now, I don't know about you, and I mean, I've been a Christian for a while. In fact, when I first became a Christian, I was super excited because I thought, okay, I'm now this tr transformed person, right? And I'm going to go to church, and I'm going to meet all these other people, and then all of a sudden I get to church, and everyone seems perfect, and I'm going, oh, wait a minute, I missed something here because I'm sure struggling. So maybe I'm a really terrible Christian. And so what I learned over the years is that they were all lying. <laughs> right? <laughs> We all struggle. In fact, I requested that we sing Come Thou Found of Every Blessing today. It's one of my favorite hymns. And can you guess what my favorite line is? Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. I call that Tuesday. Monday, I'm all like, woo, right? Because Sunday just happened. And, you know, so you're just like all energized. You're like, this week is going to be the new week, the new me. I'm going to live for God 100%. And I'm just everything in, and I'm going to do it all right. Monday rolls around. I'm still kind of excited. Tuesday, you know, I get up and step on the Lego. <laughs> Words come out. <laughs> Driving to work. Somebody cuts, you off. Somebody cuts me off. And, I'm and the first thing I think of is, do I have any crosses on my car? Because what I want to do next, I don't know. <laughs> and it's like as the week progresses, I wander farther away. 
Now, it's not my intention to do that. I actually want to follow God. And I've had people come up to me and go, I'm not sure if I'm a Christian because I really struggle with these things. And, and I've always told people, I think the fact that you worry about that proves you are. <laughs> Right, you wouldn't care, you know? Like a lost person who's not wondering how to get saved probably isn't saved. I mean, does anyone in this room besides me doubt their salvation on occasion? Right? And it's like, am I really saved? Because those were some not really nice thoughts I had about that person. Or, you know that thing I said? And that's what I love about the Bible. Now, here's something you need to know about the Bible. The Bible is, again, not one book, but 66 books, right? It is a collection. It's a library of writings, right, inspired by God, written through people as God dictates. And it doesn't cover every aspect of human history or even human relationships or even the things we do because the Bible is actually not about us. And this is something that I think the church in America has gotten way off track because we, we come to the Bible like it's the guidebook and that it's about us. You know, I'll give you an example. We like to tell the story of David and Goliath and we always say, well, we're David and we can defeat any giant. You're not David. I'm not David. We're the Israelite army cowering in the corner crying. That's us. Jesus is David. And he can defeat every enemy. How many of you have ever heard the phrase, God will never give you more than you can handle? How many of you understand that that's not true? God will never give you anything that he can't handle. If you could handle it, you don't need him. Right? It's like, well, I don't need him. I got it. I'm covered. In Psalm 23, God is going to equate himself, well, David, as he writes the psalm. And, and do you think David understands shepherds? King David? He started as one, right? Now, just so you know, a shepherd is not a good title to have. It was always the lowest of the lowest who was the shepherd or the youngest in the family. So just the fact that when the angels came and told of the birth of the Messiah, who did they go to first? Shepherds watching their flocks, right? The lowest of the low is where they went first. They didn't go to the palace. They went to the shepherds, the nobodies. When God calls himself a shepherd, he's putting himself below. The word pastor means shepherd. That's what it means. And it's you put yourself below. See, and there, there's the office of pastor, and then there's the gift of pastoring, which lots of Christians have. And it's that ability to just bring yourself low and serve somebody else. Now, the Bible equates God as shepherd and then equates us as sheep. Not a compliment. <laughs> okay? Not, not, exactly. Right? Not a compliment. Sheep are stubborn. They, yeah, they are. They're dumb. I mean... You ever just watch them? You're just like, oh my goodness. I mean, they're tasty, but that's not what we're talking about. <laughs> they're dumb. I mean, and, and a sh the sheep is, is not a wild animal. <laughs> it's owned. It's a domesticated animal. And the shepherd has to constantly stay with the sheep. You drive around and you see the, the fields with sheep in them. You usually see a little trailer in there somewhere, right? Because the shepherd stays with the sheep and sleeps with the sheep. And so when King David is writing this psalm, he's writing it, okay, as scripture will show, you know, God's like, I'm the shepherd and all my people are sheep. In Isaiah 53, it says, all like sheep have wandered and gone astray, right? But you're going to notice a little bit different language in Psalm 23 because he says, the Lord is my shepherd, Okay? So you have this overarching understanding that God is the shepherd of his people. For, for years, when I pastored, people would say, oh, you're the senior pastor. I'm like, no. I might be the lead pastor or the teaching pastor. Jesus is the chief 
pastor. He's the chief shepherd. Right? Jesus is the chief shepherd over every church of his flocks. Right? And so we need to kind of go into this Lord is my shepherd. There is Psalm 23. But I need you to think about you as a sheep. How good of a sheep are you? You're like, well, I stay in line all the time. No, we don't. I don't know how many times I have found myself in the weeds. And you would think that the longer I was a Christian, I wouldn't do that as much. But if you go back and read the Bible, I mean, does anyone here besides me read the Bible and you're just like, what the heck were they thinking? These idiots. Right? It's like, we're going to follow God, and then they wander off. And, uh, you're right? and so then God judges them, and then they come wandering back to God. And you're like, okay. My favorite is when people look at Adam and Eve and go, well, I wouldn't have done that. I'm like, they were perfect and did it. <laughs> Guarantee you would have done it. Right? And then we, and here's what we tend to do then as Christians. And I don't think we do it intentionally. I think it's just kind of the sin nature that we're still fighting with the flesh. Is we like to try to think we're better sheep than we are. So we can compare ourselves to the other sheep so we can feel better about ourselves. And so then we start coming up with our own rules for us to follow that God never came up with. And then we're like, I, I can keep that one. What's your problem? I got six gold stars from Sunday school, right? You know, and so we have the, those kind of things going on because we assume that's what God's going to base everything off of. But the reality is, is none of us are good. None of us do it right. I mean, there's a lot of things we can talk about. You know, and we look at the world and we're like, what's wrong with them? Well, you know what? We struggle too. Martin Luther, one of the phrases he used was simul justice et peccator, which means at the same time righteous and a sinner. I mean, don't you struggle with that? And what tends to happen is maybe as we can excel, or maybe that's not the area we tend to struggle in, we can actually look down on our fellow sheep and somehow think we're a better one. When the reality is, we all struggle. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. And when I find myself out in the weeds, the very first thing that happens is uh, I want to withdraw from God. Now, the Bible says that there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. And, and don't confuse conviction and condemnation. Condemnation is when Satan steps in and says, I can't believe you did that. I can't believe you said that. I can't believe you thought that. And if it's drawing you away from God and his people, it's not from God. Right? Satan is condemning us. I mean, because in Scripture, who is qualified to do any of the jobs God called them to do? I mean, I always like look at my sin, and then I'll start to get all mopey, and then I, I remember other people in Scripture as I'm reading it, and I'm like, well, there's King David. God called him a man after his own heart. Now, I don't know about you, and this is, you don't have to say anything or raise your hand, but I've never committed adultery and then murdered somebody. Now, if I were to gather around the Apostle Paul and King David and Peter and these guys and start complaining about my sins, they would all probably start laughing at me. They'd be like, you're not even on the team, buddy. You're not even junior varsity. You're not, I mean, you're like, you know, I mean, the, the vast majority, and it's really struck me when I first found out, the vast majority of the Bible was written by people who'd killed somebody. Now, I'm not telling you to go out and kill somebody. But look what God can do with somebody. When we take an honest look at the Apostle Paul, who was the greatest missionary 
in history. I mean, look what God did through him. Prior to his conversion, he was the equivalent of ISIS. He was. He gathered up Christians, men, women, and children, drugged them out of their homes, and had them executed. And he did it over and over and over again. In fact, he was so consumed by it that he jumps on a donkey and starts heading off to a city 75 miles away just so he can get them there. And on his way there, the shepherd smacks him around a little bit, <laughs> blinds him, right? So as we look at Psalm 23, there's the overall picture of God as shepherd, but this is my shepherd. God cares about all of his people. But he cares about us individually as well. He will leave the 99 to go get the one. Remember, that verse isn't for you and I either. We tend to go, well, we've got to go get the one. I'm like, no, no, no. He leaves the 99 to go get the one. Because you won't be able to do anything. I mean, if you look at most Christian bookstores, most of their books are on things that aren't our job. How to build a church and how to convert people. Two things that are not our job. Because Jesus will build his church and the Holy Spirit will convict people of their sins. Not our job. What's our job? Love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And as we go out and do good works, they will see those good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. And then we proclaim the message of hope and peace. The message of salvation. So if you have a Bible, because I don't have time like Jim to do really fancy PowerPoints all week long. Not that that's not a bad thing. I'm glad he does, and I learn a lot from him. But I'm a good old, in fact, I like paper. <laughs> I like hard coffee, right? <laughs> if you like the phone, that's fine. I, I, I don't care. You can use your fake Bible. Just kidding. <laughs> But in Psalm 23, it starts off, and it's just a psalm of David. Again, David, they're thinking most likely he's king at this point, thinking back. And, and, and in Psalm 23, it actually portrays God in two different kind of viewpoints, shepherd and host. And he starts off, and he says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And so David is declaring an allegiance here. My shepherd, the one who watches after me, the one who protects me, the one who cares about every little thing. I mean, do you realize how that God cares about even the smallest, most minutest thing in your life? He does. Does it seem like he does sometimes? No. Sometimes it seems like he's a million miles away, but guess what? We know better. And he says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It means I won't have any wants. Now, notice it, it means our needs is what that means. Don't confuse needs and greeds. Right? The Lord is my shepherd. I can't wait for the iPhone 14. <laughs> no, that's not a need, right? We get confused in our world. Right? God never promises our greeds. And sometimes what we need is something to get taken away from us. Right? Sometimes we need to go stand on the corner. He's going to take care of our needs, though. But we don't always know what those are. And sheep definitely don't. <laughs> he says, I shall not want. And, and you need to come at this, I shall not want, from two different directions. One is that God will give you everything you need. So it's from the shepherd perspective of what he is going to do for us. The problem is, is we tend to stop there. I mean, think about your own prayers. If I think, I think about mine, a lot of it has a lot of asking for him to do things for me. In fact, most of the time, it seems like that's why I'm praying. 
Is it wrong to ask? No, the Lord said, keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking, right? But how much of our time when we're in conversation with the Lord is about what we want or need? So when he says, I shall not want, it's he will provide your needs. But at the same time, I shall not want means I'm going to be completely satisfied with everything he's given me. Makes it a little bit harder, right? Because, let's be honest, life does not make sense. It just doesn't. There's things that go on, I'm like, what? Or that's not the way I had it planned. Or this looks like a sure thing and now it's not. Or I wasn't expecting that to happen. But God knows, right? He says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. I like that, you know, the word make there is very important. Where's my workaholics? <laughs> One of the commandments is, six days you shall work. But on the seventh. Do you realize that we're actually designed for a seven-day work, seven-day week of working six, resting one? And other countries in, in history have tried to change that. They wanted an eight-day week or things like that, and it never worked ever. Anytime they've ever tried to change it, it only works when it's seven. Because God designed us that way. Right? And think about our week. We now rest on the first day of the week. You realize Sunday is the first day of the week. Okay? Now, six days you shall work, and on the seventh, rest. So you need to have... Working six, resting one. That needs to be your pattern. If you don't, God will make you rest. And sometimes that's in the form of illness. Anyone ever worked so much, he just crashed? So what I like to do about this point in my life, as I read through this, is I like to raise my hand and resign as supreme commander of the universe. Because guess what? When I rest, it's actually a faith thing. Do you trust God enough to just take a break? We don't really talk about taking breaks enough in Christianity. We're always talking about doing stuff. And I'm not against doing stuff. But we're supposed to take rest. I mean, Jesus is our Sabbath. You, you, do you realize that you can take a nap to the glory of God? How awesome is that? I can lay down in my bed or on the couch, my recliner, wherever, and I can close my eyes until the glory of God lay there with my eyes closed, and that's still a form of worship. Now, sheep need to be made to lie down in green pastures. <laughs> So he's taking us to areas, right? He makes me lie down in green pastures. These are places that nourish us and feed us because that's part of what the shepherd does. He's like, look, this is good for you. Now, sometimes they have to be forced to lay down. When Paul was on his missionary journey, here's what he knew. You need to go preach the gospel. That's pretty much all he knew. How does he know where to go? Did Paul ever try to go somewhere he shouldn't have? Yeah, right? So how did he know? Spirit said, don't go that way. A dream, right? Sometimes that happened. Uh, and those are the ones we like, right? You know, when God, like, he came to me in a dream, and he's like, hey, do this. We're like, yeah, that was awesome. Here's the ones we don't like. Oh, man, I need Paul to get to that island. I'm going to sink his boat. We're usually not happy about that one, right? Like, wait, what? Oh, and spend three days at sea. By the way, has anyone here done that? Oh, okay. And then he gets on the island, and we're going, all right, God's faithful. You know, because if you listen to what a lot of people in our culture say about Christianity... When you become a Christian, everything becomes easier and better and wonderful and everything goes your way and you get lollipops and unicorns and bubblegum and all that other stuff. 
And now don't take this the wrong way, but when I came to Christ, he ruined my life. <laughs> because I had to change everything and everything got more complicated. <laughs> and so Paul gets up on shore and he's like, whew, all right, God, I got a picture. You wanted me here. Why the snake bite then? <laughs> it was, right? It was for everyone else. We don't think about that either, do we? See, God has to make us do certain things, and sometimes certain things happen to us that aren't really entirely for us. But as sheep, we trust the shepherd. He says, he, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Now, sheep need four things to lay down. Okay? Sheep by nature are timid, so they're afraid. If, if a sheep is afraid, they will not lie down. They stand. Sheep also don't like friction among the other sheep. If there's, not, if there's friction among the family, the sheep won't lie down. Sheep also don't like being annoyed by flies and parasites. If they have lots of flies bothering them and lots of parasites on them, they won't lie down. Sheep also will not lie down when they're hungry. What does it take to make a sheep lie down? They got to be satisfied. In who? In the shepherd. Knowing that the shepherd is there, knowing that they don't need to be afraid. Knowing, see, because the Holy Spirit, believe it or not, the Bible tells us multiple places, the Holy Spirit brings unity. That's one of the main things that he does among the flocks, among his people. And when God's people are divided, I promise you the Holy Spirit's not in there. Holy Spirit brings unity. The shepherd brings unity and relieves friction. Also, the shepherd removes the pestilence from us, right? He removes the flies. He removes, he gets, he has to get the things that are bothering us away. And he needs to make sure we're fed. Now, notice this is all the things that he has done. And that he continues to do. What part have you played so far in this? Right? Nothing. The shepherd steps in. If you need the pastures, that's where he puts you. If you need the water, that's where he takes you. You ever just sat in a nice meadow with a stream? Like maybe under a tree on a nice temperature day? Not like a hot day, not too cold. It's just, you know, Goldilocks just right kind of stuff. And how relaxing that is. Do you realize that even in the middle of chaos, we can feel that way? But when the sheep try to take charge, it doesn't do so well, right? He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul, revitalizes me, recharges me. Right? Those times when God sometimes has to make you lie down, He's not doing it because he's mad at you. In fact, this is something that we need to understand as Christians. If you are in Christ, God will never be angry with you. Ever. And he won't be because he was already angry at Jesus in your place. That doesn't mean he won't be disappointed. That doesn't mean he won't correct. And we'll get to that here in a second. But he will never be angry with you. Because it would be unjust and unrighteous for him to be angry at Christ on our behalf and then turn around and be angry at us. But not all the time when he's making us lie down do we see it as something good. 
He says he restores my soul. He revitalizes me. We need those things. And, and, one, and one of the things that we have an issue with, especially in our culture, see, we, we, we come to the to scriptures and we come to them as 2022 from the United States of America. Now, don't get me wrong. I've served this country in the military for years. I've worked for the U.S. government almost my entire life. I think it's a great country. But Jesus did not drape himself in the American flag on the cross. Jesus did not come to save America. He did come to save Americans, though. And I think we have gifts that we overlook a lot, right? In fact, if, if you go read Deuteronomy chapter 6 and just kind of equate that to you and I today, because God says, hey, I'm going to take you into this land full of milk and honey and everything's going to be great, everything's going to be wonderful, and then you're going to forget about me. I think that's what's happened here. Is we have it too easy. You know, we have our retirements and we have our savings accounts and we have our medicine and we have all of these other things that we don't worry as much and we don't, right, and we don't depend on God as much. My son just got back from Thailand and he can tell you stories of things over there that I don't ever see here. And part of me wants to go, yeah, no, yeah, right, whatever. The reality is God moves and does those things there. Not all the time does he do them here because we're too self-dependent. And if we would just be the sheep and let the shepherd lead. He restores my soul, right? He knows what's coming. and we, Even in our, our week, today's the first day of the week. And if you go read Genesis, it says, an evening and morning was the first day. An evening and morning was the second day. An evening and morning, right? Because the Jewish day actually starts the night before. Now think about that. What if you shifted your entire mentality into that viewpoint? That you actually begin your day resting. And then you wake up, and then you end your day working. We don't do that, do we? We mentally begin our day working, and then we're wore out, and then we rest. It's a lot easier to fill up before you go out than to go out on empty and then try to catch up. This is what he does. This is really why we gather on the first day of the week to give glory to God, but also to just kind of, we got a week coming. We need the first day of the week. We need it to recharge. Not for what we just did. We need it for what's coming. Now, we don't know what's coming, but we continue on. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Right, because so I can look to this week. Now, here's how much I know about this week. I know what I have planned. That's all I know about this week. <laughs> now, here's what I well, I take that back. I know two things about this week. I know what I have planned, and I know it probably won't go that way. <laughs> because God plans, or we plan, and God goes, I need to correct some things. I got something else for you. Right? But it says that he leads me in paths of righteousness. So anywhere God is taking us, he's taking us the right way. He's leading us in the right steps. We don't need to worry about that, even though it doesn't always make sense. And then it says, for his namesake. Why does he do it? Because it makes him look good. Right? We don't take his name in vain. We follow him and we represent him and we make him look good. And he wants us to follow in the path of righteousness for his glory. See, again, this book's not about you and me. This book is about God and his glory. Because you know what would be really just, loving, kind, and fair of God? Way back in Genesis to go, I'm sorry you screwed it up. See ya. That would still be kind, loving, just, and fair. Right? When we committed cosmic treason, 
and decided we knew better than God. After all he ever does is give. And this is something hard for us, especially if we've been wronged. You need to understand something. No one has ever wronged you nor hurt you as bad as you have done to God. No one. And these are the things I think of as I'm prone to wander. As I'm prone to leave the God I love. Because it's not that I don't love him. I'm stupid. And I like my own way. And I think I know what's best for me. And I think it's over there. <laughs> and so I go. Verse 4. We're very familiar with this one. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. But there's a few things here that we need to understand. For one, he's talking about a valley and the shadow of death. It doesn't necessarily mean death. It can mean darkness. And he takes us, right? Even though I go through dark times. This isn't a mountaintop. Right? Remember, you're in one of three places. You're either on the mountaintop or you're heading into the valley or you're coming out of the valley. That's your life. If there were no valleys, there would be no mountaintops, and therefore it'd just be flat, plain, and boring. And where do we learn? We don't learn on the mountaintops. We learn in the valleys. And even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Now, how many here have ever been hurt by a shadow? If like So my shadow's like right here. So if someone stood over here and then I moved my arm like that and my shadow hit your face. Would that hurt you? You see the point? Jesus already removed death. There's nothing physically there that can hurt us. It's just the shadow of it. And it scares us. But death has been conquered. It's just a shadow. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Now, the other thing we have to remember is there's a different way of doing shepherding in the west and the east. In the west, we sit behind them and usually have dogs and everything else and push the sheep along. Eastern cultures, the shepherd goes in front of the sheep and the sheep follow the shepherd. And they know his voice. And they follow it wherever it goes. Which means, when you're going through the valley of the shadow of death, Jesus has already gone through it before you. That's why the next line says, I will fear no evil. When you're going through the valley, remember, Jesus was already there. All you need to do is step where he stepped. Now, I'm going to guess that I'm probably in the minority here of someone who's walked through an active minefield. Anyone else besides me ever walked through one? Okay, it's terrifying. <laughs> okay, I, just, uh, I didn't intentionally do it. Just kind of found myself in one in a combat zone. And so I had to have someone come and clear out to me and then follow them back. Where do you think I stepped? <laughs> exactly where they stepped. I've also driven through one. An armored Humvee in front of me, me behind, and I'm driving. I was 19. My buddy leans over and he's like, you better not mess, get out of his tracks. I'm like, oh, trust me, you know, I'm like glued, you know, you're terrified. When you're in scary places, when you're in dark places, you just step right where he stepped because he's already been there. Remember, God is outside of time and space. 
which means it's not only that God knows tomorrow, he's already in tomorrow working, which blows my mind. And the only way that I can wrap my head around it, so you guys watch the Peach Days Parade. Now, you could see the part of the parade that was in front of you. Could you see the front of the parade and the end of the parade? What if you got in a helicopter? In a helicopter, you can see the whole parade at once. That's like the best explanation I could have ever been able to come up with on this, is that God is in everything and sees everything all at one time, the beginning and the end. And all we can see is right in front of us. And there goes the marching band. And right, that's all we can see. That's all we can deal with is what's happening now. And we spend so much time either worrying about what is going to happen or what did happen. And we never pay attention to where we're at now. I look back on my life and there's places I'm just like, I wish I would have paid more attention when I was there. Because I missed out on so many things. Or I, I just wish I would have been present. Our modern... How do I word this without offending people? <laughs> Our modern therapy world has this big problem. And here's what they want you to do. Look inward and backward. Paul says, look forward and up. If we spend all of our time inside of us, well, I, I, and until I'm good, I can't help anybody else. Uh, that's actually opposite of what the Bible says. The Bible says stop thinking about yourself and you'll be able to help somebody else. <laughs> and he says, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Now this next one confuses me a little. For your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, part of that I get, because part of what... So there's a little debate here. They're thinking it's either one instrument, which is used as a rod and a staff, or it could be two. Some people lean with two, it says rod and staff, so if it was a rod, it would be like, like a club, like a, a cudgel, you know? It's a way of... It, it's actually used as defense. And then the staff was used for walking and directing the sheep. So I get the whole rod part comforts me because it's like, yep, Jesus is going to smack the heck out of any of my enemies, right? When the wolf comes, Jesus will make sure it's taken care of. The staff is used for correction of the sheep. That doesn't... I, I struggle at times with that being comfortable. <laughs> but think about it. The Bible says, Though, those who he corrects, he loves. That if you spare the rod, you spoil the child. Right? He says, if you do not even discipline your kids, you don't love them. Mm -hmm. I mean, we live in a world right now that's proof of that. Right? We need to get to the point where when God is disciplining us or correcting us, that we find comfort in that. That's kind of hard, isn't it? But we've got to find that comfort. Because if God is correcting you, you ever watch someone else that's not a believer get away with something? Ever make you mad? I'm just like, come on, God. Where's this? If I was God... <laughs> If I was God, I would have the smite the kindling button. And it'd be just like, yeah. <clears throat> right? Yeah. I, I identify with the two disciples that went, hey, Lord, these guys don't even care we're in town. Should we call down fire from heaven? See, that'd be my first response. <laughs> like, can we just burn them up? <laughs> but see, we want justice for everyone else and mercy for ourselves. I'm really glad God didn't hit the smite key on me. 
Because I'm sure there's, I'm on some other list somewhere up there that's like the you got to be kidding me list. I'm pretty sure I'm on that one. <laughs> it's like, oh, another check mark for Joe, right? I mean, that's... It's like, I, I'm pretty sure I'm like, when it says, you know, I'll leave the 99 to get the one, that's usually me. Sorry, guys. You know, when Jesus wanders off, you're like, where is he? He's probably tracking me down somewhere. And then disciplining me and bringing me back. And I find great comfort in that. <laughs> because he who began a good work in me will see it through to completion. I don't like the way I am, but here's what I do know. God's not done with me. Because if, if, if I'm the completed picture, it's like, I don't want to go to heaven. It's like, he's, this is it. It's Joe. It's like, he has a lot less hair than I want in heaven. Mine just migrated. I'm going to get it so I can comb it over. I'm not going to do that. That would be weird. But your rod and your staff, they come for me. He protects us from our enemies, even those we don't see. And he disciplines us because he loves us. I don't like to discipline my kids. But I have to. I mean, we've all used the thing, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. And the kids are like, I doubt it. It, it does. It hurts. Sometimes it's your hand that hurts, but <laughs> it hurts, right? It hurts to, you know, to force someone you love to do something they don't want to do so they can learn a lesson. And God does that all the time. That's why we find comfort in the rod and the staff. Like David says, you know, like your law, I delight in it like honey. I'm like, yeah, I read the law. I'm not usually like, woo, you know, <laughs> restrictions. Now, in verse 5, he actually jumps to host and is no longer in the shepherd mode. He's in the host mode of inviting us to be with him as he takes care of everything for us at the table. A meal means a lot more here than it does in our culture. We treat food like either an idol or fuel. That's pretty much how we treat it, right? In fact, we want to know how fast we can get it. I have literally pulled up to the drive-in at Wendy's and ordered my food, and they're hanging the bag out the window before I've made it to the window. And I still consider that a little slow. Because I got stuff to do. And so we treat it like it's either fuel, I got to get something in me so I can continue working, or we treat it like an idol, right? We have entire TV shows based on it, whole networks. The Food Network. Now, the vast majority of things that happen in here happen around a meal. You ever notice that? Just go read it. Jesus was always eating with people. And I'm like, in fact, they called him a glutton and a drunkard. How much in a culture that revolves around eating and drinking do you have to eat and drink to get called that? I mean, he was all. Do you know Jesus got invited to tons of parties? Do you think it was because he was boring and stuffy like, you know, some church people we know? Do you think Jesus wandered around looking like he had just ate roadkill? He was fun. I mean, I can only imagine what 13 guys walking down the road would come up with, especially where 10 of them were rednecks. Jesus and the disciples. I mean, I bet you they had some pretty crazy times, pretty fun times. And Jesus, he was fun. And meals are actually huge, important things because to sit down with somebody means I'm inviting you into my family. I'm seeing you as equal with me. I'm, I, we're fellowshipping together. We're family together. I also align myself with who you are and what you stand for. 
That's why Jesus warns when you run across certain people, don't even eat with them. And we just go like, well, that's stupid. Because in order, you know, for that to happen, you didn't eat with them. That was a sign of disrespect. That was a, you're not part of the family. It was a big thing. We don't quite understand that today. And he's the host of this meal. And he says, you prepare a table before me. He prepares the table. You'd think it'd be the other way around, but he's the servant. Do you realize how much God does for us? We always argue and complain about status and titles and everything else in our world. And the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords will get down and wash people's feet. In fact, the ultimate sign is he'll come and die a gruesome death for something he didn't even do. And he wants to sit down and eat with you. He wants to host it. You know why we like to go and eat out? Because you don't have to do the dishes and they bring you the food and take it away. See, right? That's, that's why. It's like if I go to my wife and go, hey, let's go on a date. I'll buy the groceries if you want to cook, right? You already see that I'm going to get in trouble if I even finish that sentence because that's not a date, right? A date is like, hey, we're going to go somewhere where you don't have to do that. I don't have to do that. Somebody else does it and we pay for them to do it. Jesus prepares the table. What's your job in this one? Sit down. We're doing a lot of resting and sitting in this one. I kind of like this song. And eating, yeah, right? We're good. And notice it doesn't even give any diet restrictions, like <laughs> don't eat the cheeseburger. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. How great is that? I mean, and this could be now, but this can also be in the future when it's like, all the people that just thought we were nut jobs for believing in Jesus and following him and who gave us a hard time and who killed Christians and thought they were right and we're all going to sit down with them while they're in captivity. Remember, no one gets away with anything. No one gets away with anything. They will either... Come to Jesus as Lord now, and Jesus will have paid in blood for what they did. Or they will stand before the Father, and they will pay for what they did. No one gets away with it. That's why we're supposed to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. Because God will make sure that justice happens. So we can be in the presence of our enemies and still sit down at the table and relax. Remember, this table is not table and chairs. This is reclining at the table. It's even more laid back than what we do. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Right? Bottomless drinks. Those are always my favorite at the restaurant. Except for when I haven't finished one and they bring me another one. I'm like, I had two drinks and now I have two drinks. I'm like, okay, well, I only took two sips and now I've got, it makes me look like I drink a lot of soda. But, all right, it's c cup overflows. See, when God provides, there's more than enough. When God intervenes, there's more than enough. If you couldn't open the pickle jar and your dad was Arnold Schwarzenegger, would you worry about opening the pickle jar? Or would you just go, Dad, can you handle this? This is what we do in our life, is we grab all these things that we can't accomplish and then we worry about them. Just sit at the table. Lie down in the pasture. Walk through the valley. Because I promise you, when you're walking through the valley, there's another sheep behind you. And they need to step where you step. See, one of the scariest verses in Scripture to me is when Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. 
Do, do you know what he's saying there? Hey, if you want to be a good Christian, if you want to end up just like our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, just do and say what I do. I don't think any of us in this room would dare say that. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And the idea in the original language continues on, not just in your lifetime, but for eternity. Because here's what you have to remember. Eternal life started for you and I the day we trusted Jesus as Savior. Eternal life started. We always think of eternal life as something that's yet to come. If you're in Christ, you already have it. Right? In fact, death has already been conquered. You're like, I don't know. I've been to a lot of funerals. Yeah, they're, they're changing addresses. That's it. That's all that's happening. A believer is just changing an address. And with that in mind, what do we have to fear? What's the worst they could do to you? Kill you? I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. There's days I'm like, I'm ready to go, Lord. <laughs> Can can I just go? I'm just, hey, this place is too crazy. And I'm not trying to be morbid or anything. Just don't we get that way? The Apostle Paul was that way. He's like, I'm really struggling here, guys. Because, you know, I want to be with the Lord, but I also know there's stuff I need to do here, and I'm conflicted. But the worst thing that anyone could do to you on this planet is take your life. And since death has already been conquered and we're in Christ, all that means is they're ushering us more quickly into the presence of the, the Father. I'm like, bring it on. You mean I don't have to pay bills anymore? I don't have to go to work? Bring it. I always wonder, you know, when I read through Scripture and I run across people like Lazarus, how, how bold were they after Right, he'd already been dead for four days. I would have been a little bit mad if I was Lazarus. <laughs> like, I died. I'm just like, yeah, I'm there. And then all of a sudden, I open my eyes, and I'm like in a tomb, and I've got bandages on me, and I'm just like, I'd be like, oh, man. But Lazarus wasn't resurrected in the fact that he got his glorified body. He was what we'd call revived, right, brought back to life, and he died again. But I'm, I, I will bet from that point when he walked out of that tomb to the point that he died again, I bet you no one could shut him up. <laughs> yeah. And they're probably like, how do we get rid of this guy? Let's just kill him. He's like, please. I've already been there. I already know what it's like. I think that's why Paul was just so fearless. Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Think about that. And who's he saying this to? Sheep. Right? The sheep. You and I. The ones that are prone to wander. In Martin Luther's 95 Theses, the first one is, all of life is one of repentance. Because guess what? I blow it every day. The thing is, is we come up with ratings and color codings to make us feel better. Like it's a white lie. Because since we color coded it white lie, it's now somehow okay. Well, that wasn't a lie. That was a white lie. I'm a good Christian. I'm like, uh, that was a lie. Even though you said it was a white one. Or my favorite is, well, they weren't liars. It, it, it was a half-truth. That's like being almost pregnant. Yeah. You are or you're not. It's a lie or it's the truth. 
no half lies but don't we do that or my favorite is when we compare ourselves to Hitler well not as bad as Hitler like true <laughs> you're still terrible because what does it take to get into heaven perfection that's what it takes perfection now what if you started right now and for the rest of your life you were perfect now what too, too bad right you already weren't perfect who deserves to go to heaven no one The only way we get there is through the blood of the Lamb that was slain. The only way we get there is when we repent. And even though we are in Christ, we make a mess out of things on a regular basis. That does not mean you don't love God. That does not mean you're not a Christian. We've bought into this idea that somehow we have to be perfect. Just go back and read this book, this book again. See, because w there's two parts to salvation, and I'm going to kind of close with with this because it's really important for us to understand. There's two parts, and we tend to preach one part and leave the other part out. And and the one part that we all get is that if you come to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, your sins will be forgiven. Is that true? Yeah. True, right? The Bible says it. Right? Call in the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. He removes our sin as far as the east is from the west. And that seems to be about as far as we go. And then we spend the rest of our time as Christians trying to be really good ones and then getting completely upset and freaking out and wandering off when we can't. Because we forgot about the other part of salvation. It's called imputed righteousness. Not only did Jesus forgive you and I of all of our sins, past, present, and future, he also gave us his righteousness. Don't forget that part. He didn't just erase your criminal record. He traded records with you he erased the name at the top which means we get credit for every good deed he did right now even though it doesn't feel like it and even though we're prone to wander and even though we fight this body that is still stuck in sin God sees you as 100% righteous right now. Don't forget that. Because Satan will exploit that. And he will make you wander. And when you do wander, he'll make you feel really terrible for doing it and think God can't use you or God doesn't love you or maybe you're not even his. And here's the reality. When you wander, the shepherd's right there. And it might hurt a little as he brings you back. But he does it because he loves us. Because we are forgiven of all of our sins. And because we have his righteousness on us. And when we stand at the gates of heaven, we don't get let in for what we did. We get let in for what he did. The Father sees the Son. The son vouches for us. Now he's mine. Let him in. She's mine. Let her in. If you read Revelation at the end, it says that books, plural, the term there means libraries full of, will be opened and the deeds of all of those who are going into the lake of fire will be exposed. And there's only one book of those who will be saved. It's not about how well you follow the rules. God will take care of that. It's how much do you love the shepherd? How much do you trust the shepherd? 
That's what being a Christian is. You are not going to get to the gates and St. Peter will be standing there going, how's your Sunday school attendance or how's your church attendance on Sunday? That's not, uh, that's not even part of it. I'm not saying don't come to church. I'm not saying don't read your Bible. I'm not saying don't, uh, right? But it's not based on those things. Our salvation and the love God has for us is based on him. And you and I, if you're in Christ, are his sheep. One of the, I think, worst questions that I ever hear people bring up is, can you lose your salvation? Terrible question. Because it's not about you or I. Do you want to know the right question? Can the chief shepherd lose his sheep? That's the question. Can the shepherd lose the sheep? What we, we call the Lord's Prayer isn't really the Lord's Prayer. It's just been called that because Jesus would never have to pray that prayer because he never sinned and would not have to say, forgive us my debts. But there is a prayer that I would, in homework, if you would like some, you don't have to, Read John chapter 17. That's the actual Lord's Prayer. That's when Jesus himself prays in the garden. And he prays for his disciples. And he even prays for you and I. And I read through that prayer this morning. And I was like, oh my goodness. All he really cares about is unity between his family. And that God brought us there. And that he can't lose us. And we'll be with him forever. And when you find yourself in the shadow of the valley of death, just remember, it's a shadow. Can't hurt you. He's already conquered Satan, sin, and death. Nothing to worry about. No matter how bad it gets. And a hundred years from now, guess what? We're all going to be sitting around a table. And, you know, the choicest meats, the choicest wines. I mean, and he's going to prepare it, and we're going to sit with him. And I got lots of questions for lots of people who I've been reading about for my whole life. <laughs> I'm going to annoy him. i be like, all right, let's put Joe. I'll probably be at the kitty table. <laughs> just so you know, that's where I'll be sitting. But I just want to encourage you with that, because that's what God has how he spoke to me this week because I wander way more than I want to and if it took someone who was completely had it all figured out in order to be able to preach or serve God none of us would be able to because none of us are qualified enough to do it but Jesus is and you and I have his righteousness which means we're good. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to sing. We were singing one more song, right? Okay. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to sing. And uh, I just hope you have a good week. That, that Think of today as your filling up of the bucket. And try it. Just try it. Try, try thinking tonight when you sit down to rest that that's actually the beginning of your day. That's your Monday. Your Monday starts tonight at sundown. And you're resting first, and then you're going to go to bed and get some sleep, and then you're going to wake up and finish out your Monday until Tuesday evening, which one is what we're told Monday evening when Tuesday begins. You'll see, if you just shift the perspective, it really changes your day because you're going into the day full and ready for it as opposed to coming home and crashing and burning because that's the way God designed us.